Yes, God, that's why we're here today. Father, for your name to be exalted, for your name to be lifted high. And we come together in this room, sons and daughters who've been adopted by the blood of Christ and washed clean and filled with the spirit of God that we may be made new and walk in new lives on this earth. And so Father, the names of the two churches ultimately don't matter. Our names ultimately don't matter. Lord, we want your name to be lifted high and our names to be forgotten. As, as John the Baptist said, that I may decrease, that you may increase. Whether the people of this city would know your name and not our names, that's our desire. So Father, we look forward to the day where every tribe, every tongue, every nation is gathered around the throne crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And just for a moment, we forget ourselves. We become so enthralled in who you are and so enthralled of looking upon you that we forget ourselves and Lord, just get lost in the fullness of who you are. We pray that in this room this morning, Father, that we would get lost in you for a little bit the problems that we bring into this room this morning, that we would forget those, or that the insecurities that we carry with us, that we would forget those, or the problems that we have to step back into after the service, we'd forget those, Lord, that we would just stop and be filled with awe of the God that you are, of the way that you love us, of the plan that you have for our lives, and Lord, that we would walk out of this place more filled with faith, more filled with hope, more filled with joy, Lord, knowing how good you are, and Lord, that you love your sons and daughters. You're not going to leave us hanging. You're not going to let us drown in the midst of the problems that we're facing. And so, Father, we invite you to this place now. Spirit, would you come and speak the words that we need to hear? I thank you that you are an infinite God, which means that your, your attention is never divided. The fullness of your love and the fullness of your attention is on every person in this room, always. And we need that right now. We need specific words. We need specific areas of our life addressed. And as we open up your powerful word, the word that your spirit has breathed out, we ask that the spirit inside of us would connect and, and bring us alive in a new way. We love you, Lord. We thank you for this time together. together. We thank you for the, the morning that you've given us. We just pray that you would meet with us now. We love you and pray these things in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. Zach and Stephanie, thank you so much for being here and for leading us. Um, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Kyle. I'm one of the lead pastors at Mosaic, and uh, this is our third week together. We have so enjoyed being together so far and, and, and are just so thankful for what God is doing. Uh, we are studying and reading through the book of Jonah together. So if, you're, if you haven't been with us yet, you can go ahead and grab a Bible, open up to Jonah. We're going to be in chapter 3 this morning as we wake, work our way through that book together. Um, I want to begin this morning, and I want to just throw out a couple phrases, a couple uh, statements that I think summarize how Christians view the world. And I don't think these are super controversial. I think these are things that, that as Christians look upon the world we live in, these are just statements about the way that we as Christians view the world. But the first one is this, God is not okay with the world the way that it currently is. God is not okay with the world the way that it currently is. Malcolm referred to some of the painful things that have happened in both of our bodies this week, and it was just a reminder that God is not okay with the way that our world is currently. The things that, that hurt us hurt him, and he's grieved when he looks at a world filled with sickness and suffering and death and, and sees what this world that he created for good has been twisted into something that are not his intentions for the world. Right, so, so God is not okay with the world the way that it currently is. That's the first statement. Second is this, God wants to change the world. And God has a plan to change the world. He's not going to leave us in this broken, twisted state that we find ourselves in. God's desire and God's plan from the very beginning was to create the world for his glory and for his good. And as it got twisted, he didn't just walk away from the world and let it spin into chaos God's plan was that he was going to, to restore and renew and redeem everything that was once broken. Right, so, so those two statements, hopefully, are, don't catch you off guard. God is not okay with the way that the world is currently. God wants to do something about it. This third one may push you a little bit because God wants to use you and he wants to use me to make the world right again. You with me? God wants to use us. God wants to use humans to restore all that is broken in our world. Right, God wants to use his creation, his humans, to make things right again and to change the world. But here's what I know is going on in this room as I, as I make a statement like that. 
that God wants to use you and God wants to use us to change the world. I know that this room is full of some pessimists and some optimists, right? And I'm not going to make you identify yourself if you don't know which one of those you are. I bet your spouse can tell you or your friends can tell you. Pessimists are these people that see the glass half empty. They are realists. They, they, they claim to see things the way that they really play out, right? Typically lean towards the negative. Optimists, on the other hand, are butterfly and song people. They see the, the positive, the, life's, the, the, the glass is half full. So you're all nudging each other. I know that you're all going to have conversations at lunch today, but which one of those you are? Right? And here's what tends to happen around that statement that God wants to use us to change his world. The, the optimists in the room want to change the world. And they actually believe that it is fully possible. Right? The optimists in the room are saying, yes, we're going to change the world. We're going to do it. We're going to take it on. We're going to take on every sickness and every death. And we're going to do something powerful in this world. The optimists are on board and all about that plan. The pessimists, on the other hand, and again, I'm not going to make you identify yourself. The pessimists want to change the world, but I think start to doubt that that's actually possible. Right? It sounds good. It sounds like a good fairy tale. It sounds like a good movie script. That, that humans could be used to change the world, but the pessimists in the room are thinking, even if I wanted that, and even if I believe that, I have a really hard time believing that, that humans are going to be capable, capable of, of doing something like that. And so in the long run, if you stay around a church very long, the optimists and pessimists kind of go back and forth with each other because the optimists think that the pessimists need therapy, right? They, they need a hug. They need a cup of coffee. They need more faith, right? The optimists look at the pessimists and say, come on, God's promised he's going to do these things, and he wants to do them through us, and so let's, let's go after them. And then the pessimists look at the optimists, and they think that the optimists, frankly, need a dose of reality, a kick in the pants, maybe to humble them a little bit, and to work through their naive belief, and maybe their borderline arrogance that we can do something about this, right? So I'm not categorizing any of you. You can categorize yourselves. I'm just saying in general, when it comes to this belief that God wants to use humans to change the world and to make it back into what it was created to be, those two camps begin to develop. And those two lines of thought begin, begin to, to play out within the church. And so what I want to do this morning, I want to I just navigate that tension. My goal is not to convert the optimist to pessimist or the pessimist to optimist. Whatever camp you came in in, you can stay in that camp. I'll let you be there. My goal as Christians is to talk into this, this idea of humans changing the world and Christians changing the world. My, my goal is not that we would be optimists or pessimists, but that we would be what I would call hopeful realists, right? That there would be this realism about how we do things. It, it's probably not going to be as easy as the optimists think. There needs to be a level of reality to what we think is going to happen. But there also needs to be this level of hope and this level of pressing into things that the optimists a lot of times think is impossible and maybe silly and naive to press, to press into. And so we're going to be in Jonah chapter 3, and I, I want to just press into this chapter because really it's a short chapter. We're going to read through it pretty quickly. Uh, what I want you to see in this chapter is that something we, that we read past really, really quickly is, is really profoundly important for us to catch the significance of this. Uh, something significant happens in Jonah 3 that I don't want us to miss because this is a story of a, a prophet. And if you've been here the last few weeks, even a reluctant and disobedient prophet that God is going to use to absolutely transform one of the most wicked cities that has ever existed. And all he says is five words. In the Hebrew, what, what I'm going to read is five words. In the English, it's translated into, into eight and I want both the pessimists and the optimists to, to look at this. And I want us to learn what does it look like for us actually to change the city? What does it look like for us actually to change the world? What role do we play in that? And what does it look like to be hopeful realists as it relates to our role in revival in our city and in our world? So Jonah chapter 3. Quick recap, if you missed the first two weeks, chapter one, God t tells this prophet named Jonah to go to a city called Nineveh, this massive and wicked city, and to preach against it. Jonah doesn't want to do it and runs the opposite way, boards the ship. There's a storm sent to the ship. The sailors throw him overboard. He thinks he's dead. Chapter two, uh, God sends a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And chapter two tells us about a prayer that he prayed from the belly of this great fish. And at the end of the chapter, Jonah is thrown up back onto the land. And in chapter three, essentially the story starts back over. So look at chapter three. 
And what I want you to notice, if you were here for the first week, uh, very, 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 very similar to chapter one. In fact, the wording, the phrases are very similar. There's a few things thrown in there. But this is a retelling of chapter one. This time, instead of being disobedient, Jonah chooses to be obedient. So that's what's going on here. Jonah chapter three, beginning in verse one. It says, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days journey in breadth. Again, just to wrap your mind around that, that's not saying it took three days to get to Nineveh. It's actually saying that it took three days to walk all the way from from the edge of the city to the edge of the city through, through Nineveh was a three-day walk, right? So massive city, it was a three-day walk from one side of the city to the other was what God called Jonah to do. Verse four, Jonah began to go into the city going a day's journey and he called out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Again, eight words in English, five words in the Hebrew. That's all he says from, from one edge of the city to the other, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and they put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne. He removed his robe. He covered himself with sackcloth and he sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published, uh, and published it throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let the man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and he may relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God relented of the disaster that he said that he would do to them, and he did not do it. So I want to just talk this morning very briefly about how God uses people to bring revival, how God uses people to bring revival, how God uses us, and how God invites us into this process of seeing cities changed and seeing the world changed. See, I don't want you to miss in the story because really chapter four is where the bulk of Jonah plays out. So don't miss next week. Terrell's got so much, so much good stuff to work with in chapter four. In chapter three, we read through it really fast because we've already read chapter one. We kind of know how the story plays out. And it's easy to read through chapter three and, and not really feel like much here is too significant. And what I would point out to you again is that, that the, there's several huge things that happen. God brings revival to one of, the, one of the most wicked cities that has ever existed on the face of the earth. Right, that's, a, that's a significant thing. Millions of people, and I told a few weeks ago about how violent and wicked these people are. God brings this group of people from the king down to the very lowest in the society to this place of repentance, that that is a deeply significant, and honestly, when you read the story, something that should get your attention, that that God brings repentance at that level to these people, to this wicked city of Nineveh. The, The second thing is that God uses a disobedient and reluctant, and and I would say somewhat repentant prophet to make that happen. Uh, he uses a disobedience and reluctance, and we'll see next week, he's repentant, but I would say he's kind of repentant, prophet, to go back and see one of the greatest revivals that we could ever read about. One of the most wicked cities in the world, turning away from their evil and turning to God and, 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 and understanding that, that they needed to change their ways so that God would relent of what he had planned for the city. Those are, those are massively significant things that God would choose revival for this city and that God would use a guy like Jonah, that, that five words from a reluctant, disobedient prophet would have that kind of power. And so uh, as I was reading this story this week, as I've been praying through this, this is what came to mind. I wrote it in my journal. If God can transform a large, wicked city through a few words from a reluctant prophet, what might he do through us if we set our hearts fully on him? If God could transform a wicked, evil city like Nineveh through five words from a reluctant prophet, what might he do through us if our hearts are set fully on him? See, what what I want you to know this morning, if I could summarize my sermon in four words, big things start small. 
the big things that God does start small. And that's a good word for the optimist because you want big things to start big. And it's a good word for the pessimist because when things start small, I think you can even start to doubt that anything's happening at all. But I think that the season that we're in as two churches and the season that we're in as a people, we're here because we want to see revival, right? We're here not because we think that getting up on Sunday morning and going to church is the most convenient hobby to carry out. There's lots of better hobbies than this. We're here because we truly believe that God is who he says he is and wants to do what he said he wants to do and that he wants to use us to be a part of revival in this city, right? If you're not here, I hope that, that's, I hope that you'll catch that. That's why we're here. That's why we do what we do, that we want to see God restore all that he intended for creation in this city. And yet, I think it's so important for us to read a story like this and not miss what happened to cause the revival. Because in this story, if, if, if you pay attention, a small thing happens that grows into a big thing. Big things happen, but they, they start small. So let, let me just unpack that for a few minutes for, for us. I want you to see that, that you have a role to play in this, but God's going to start small. You have a role to play in the revival of this city. You have a role to play in the health of this church. God wants you and needs you to be a part of this, but you're a part of it, and the work that he wants to do starts small. But what, what I mean by that is that a lot of times we want God to work through us, right? We want to see revival all around us, but we're a little bit hesitant to let God work in us, right? I want to see God work through me. I want to see God change my neighborhood and change my family and change my city and change the world. I, I want all that. And what I want you to see is that God never works through a person without first working in a person. He's going to start small so that he can go big. So, so what happened in Jonah? He started small, this, this story of personal repentance, of running away and t- telling God no, and even his reluctant repentance to come back and be obedient. God uses a small act of personal repentance to bring this massive, large-scale revival to the city of Nineveh. He's always going to start small and go big. He's going to start in you before he wants to work through you. And in fact, I would tell a lot of you, you've been this place in this place for so long where you've wanted God to work through you and, and you've wanted to see massive things happen around you. And this entire time, I think God's been trying to get you to slow down and let him work in you for a little while. And so I want you just to see a few things in this story. I've got two main points, and then we're going to spend some time worshiping again and letting God interact with us on a, on a personal level. But there's a few things that I want you to see here because I think this is how God starts to work small. Notice that in the story that, that, that failures don't disqualify us, they actually prepare us. The failures don't actually disqualify us, they prepare us. In Jonah's story, that first sentence, I love that it says he came to Jonah the second time. The second time. And when you think about that, Jonah was not the most convenient way for, to get word to Nineveh, Right? He'd already proven himself to not be a great messenger for the Lord. God had given him a message, and rather than going to Nineveh with it, he actually ran the opposite direction. And so if I were God, I think this would be a time where I said, you know what, I gave him a shot, he failed. There's a lot of other ways that I can use to get my word out. Jonah kind of failed the test, and I don't know if I want to try it again. But it says that God goes to Jonah a second time, not for God's benefit, but for Jonah's benefit. Right? He says, I want, there's something that I want you to do, and there's millions of other methods that I could use to do this better than you, but there's something in this for you that I want you to step into. I want you to go to Nineveh and do what I told you to do. And, and what I want to say here, along those lines, failures don't disqualify us, they prepare us. I think for most of us, there's been some point in our life where we failed. There's been some point in our life where we knew God called us to do something or asked us to be about something, and and we completely went the opposite way. We did exactly what Jonah did. And it's in those moments that it's so easy for us to begin to assume, man, I bet God's probably done with me because there's better ways to do his mission on the earth. There's better people to pick than me. And for a lot of people, there's this moment in their life where where failure happens, and we just kind of stay and, and stop and get stuck in that moment. And what I want you to see is that, that that failure makes us useful in the kingdom. Failure actually makes us useful in the kingdom. So many stories of, uh, in the Bible, if you read through it, it's actually failure and brokenness that makes people useful for the kingdom. If you've ever read the story of Moses, he doesn't become useful until he's 80 years old, right? 
The first 80 years of his life is God working through him and working through a lot of things in him so that as an 80-year-old, he could finally be useful to accomplish the mission that God has for him. You see that? I want to work in you, and then I want to work through you. These big things that I've got for you start small, and it starts with you becoming the person that I've created you to be. The story of Peter and the disciples and Paul, this is all the way throughout Scripture. You see it over and over and over again. God starts small, and it starts in us before he works through us. And so failure makes us useful. Failure is God's boot camp to prepare us. God uses failures not for his sake, but for our sake. Not because it's the easiest way for him to get his message out, but because it's the best way for us to become what he's trying to create us into. But what, what do I mean by that? So, so think about what failure teaches us. And if you failed, you may be there this morning. You failed and you're sitting in this place and don't know how to move forward. Failure does a few things for us. Failure first teaches us that we're not as good or strong as we thought, right? It's easy to go through life and think that we've got it pretty well figured out and got our lives together. And you hit these moments where you just, you're, you're almost surprised and disappointed by what comes out of you. You're surprised and disappointed that, that you're really the kind of person that you said you would never be again. And failure breaks us down by teaching us that we're not as good or as strong as we thought we were. Failure teaches us that the world isn't as safe as we thought it was. We may, we may be walking through life with this illusion of the world being this safe, easy place. And again, failure, these things that happen in our life, confront us with this reality that the world is not the safe place that we once imagined. Failure begins to break down that this idea that the world needs to be changed and saved, but it leads us to this point where I think we begin to wrestle with, do I have the ability to do that? I, I know that the world needs to be changed and saved, but I don't know what role that I'm supposed to play in that. And so when you read through the story of Scripture, and, and Jonah is included in this, suffering takes overconfidence and independence and often arrogant people, and it makes us into humble and compassionate and dependent servants. I heard one man say, never trust a leader who doesn't walk with a limp. You want to see that limp. There's that sign of brokenness that they've understood who they are and become dependent on God and his grace and his power, not their own. And so I want to just start there this morning. A lot of you doubt the ability that you have to be a part of changing the world because at some point in your life, you failed. And at some point in your life, you, you, you didn't do what God called you to do. And I want you to read those, those three words in verse one the second time. That God is a God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances. That he'll come back to you over and over again and say, hey, I still want you on the team. I still want you to be doing what I called you to do. And I want failure to be something that makes you useful. To be a more humble and compassionate and dependent servant of me. All right, so, so I want to just stop there for a minute and just ask for a lot of you to, to consider where have you failed? All right, I'm guessing that as soon as I start talking about that, a lot of you have stories and moments that you can look back on. And you know that you've, you've failed. You know that you haven't been what you've wanted to be. And my question is, in, in that failure, what did you do? In that failure, did you decide that you were going to run away from God and, and kind of cover yourself up? Or did you realize that the gospel allows you to not have to run away from God, but in your weakest moment, in the deepest sin of your life, you don't have to run away from him, but you run to him. That's what the gospel of Jesus is all about, that, that, that God doesn't accept us because we're good. God accepts us because his son died for us and changed places with us. And now we get to walk in this assurance of knowing that we're his sons and his daughters and that even on our worst day, he's our father. Even on our worst day, he wants to pick us up and, and brush us off and help us to keep on going. Uh, I've got story after story after story, and many of you in this room are the people in these stories. So often, God uses your place of deepest pain, and he makes it your most impactful place of ministry. And we don't tend to like that. The, the places of your deepest pain, the places of your deepest failure, the places where you've experienced something in this room that no one else has experienced, often our deepest places of pain become our most fruitful ministry moving forward. And I would say that for a lot of you, the way that God wants to use you to change the world is to pick you up out of that failure and to make you a compassionate person and to make you a person who is able to love other people and as you see them going through the same things that you've gone through, you get to speak back in and say, listen, I know what you're going through. I know how it feels. I know how, when I failed, what I needed someone to say to me, that you get to be those people and use your failure. And as we just sing about the things that the enemy intends for evil, we turn them for good. 
that, man, this happened and it hurt me and it broke me, but I'm, I'm going to run to God with it. Then allow God to use that failure and to use that place as a place where I get to go and, and, and be what God created me to be. But see, the, the failures don't disqualify us. They prepare us, but they only prepare us when we do what Jonah did. Now, Jonah decided to turn back to the Lord and run back to the Lord. And, and what I want you to see is that this, this is a place where oftentimes we can get stuck because failure and suffering don't inherently make us better. Failure and suffering don't inherently prepare us for our calling. It is learning from our failure. It is running to God with our failure and running to God with our suffering that makes us better and, and, and prepares us for our calling. See, the, the reality of, of suffering and the reality of failure is it won't let you stay the same. It won't let you stay in the same place. And what it's going to do to you, what, what suffering and failure does to every single one of us, it'll either make us more or less self-absorbed. It'll either make us more or less selfish and full of self-pity. Right, so, so you may know people that they've experienced failure and their response to failure, their response to suffering was to just shut down and turn inward. Right, suffering will always either make you more or less self-absorbed, more or less full of self-pity. And it only turns us into world changers if, if we let them draw us out of ourselves. If they let us bring us to this place where we recognize, man, I'm, I'm not as strong as I thought I was. And I'm not as good as I thought I was, but Jesus is better. Right? Where it brings us to this place where the world is not a safe place. The world is not an easy place to navigate. But Jesus is big and he's with me and he hasn't left me alone to navigate all this. Right? The, the sufferings and failures are meant to turn us out, not to, to turn us in on ourselves. Right, so, so failures don't disqualify us. And that's the first thing that I wanted to point out here is that Jonah gets a second chance. And, and if you're in this room and you're wondering if there's a second chance for you, man, that's, that's the good news of the gospel. Is that God's not going to give up on you. God's not going to stop pursuing you. He's not going to stop running after you. He wants you with him. He wants you to be a son and, or a daughter who gains your identity from him and then goes and lives your life in the world for him. But again, the, 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 these big things start small. And there may be this small place of healing, this small place where failure crippled you. And God's asking you to go back there tonight and, and or this morning and not hide from it, but to say, God, this is this place where I've been broken and I want to run to you with it and let you heal me and make me what I'm supposed to be. Right? Failures don't disqualify us, they prepare us. And then the second truth is this. God uses repentant people to produce great revivals. God uses repentant people to produce great revivals. And again, it's what the, this, this season of our churches is all about, that God is using repentant people to produce great revivals. I love in this story that, that God chose a prophet who failed and used him to transform a city. God chose a prophet who reluctantly repented and still used him to change a city. God gave him five words, right? Not, not, a, not a compelling sermon, five words, right, to change a city. And there's something going on here where God is showing what he uses to create revival. See, we all want to see revival in Nacogdoches. And, and if we want to see revival, what I want to talk about for a few minutes is that we have to become great at repentance. If we become great at repentance, this city is going to experience revival. And I want to be clear about what I'm saying because I know that that word is not a real positive word, right? This, this, this is one of the things that, that, that I'm most passionate about. When I talk about repentance, it shouldn't be a negative thing. This should be the most positive thing in the world for us. Repentance is not a negative word that people throw at you to threaten you. Repentance is the greatest news in the world. Uh, repentance literally means change your mind. Think about that. That the word in the Greek, metanoia, change your mind. And I want you to think through how many different times you've had that word spoken to you or, or heard that word. And you've heard not change your mind, but stop screwing up. Get your life together. Clean yourself up. Do, do you see how different those two words and phrases are? For, for us to be told, change your mind, is radically different from you being told, stop sinning. Clean up your life. There's this passage in Mark chapter 1. It's the first spoken words of Jesus in the gospel of Mark. And he comes along, and I think it's actually going to be up on the screen, uh, the, the Mark 1, verses 14 and 15. 
The very first thing that Jesus says in the Gospel of Mark, says John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the Gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the Gospel. That the first spoken words of Jesus, repent and believe the Gospel. When you read John the Baptist, he preached repentance. When you read the prophets, they pro- preached repentance. When you read the sermons in the book of Acts of Peter and Paul, they preached repentance. And if we're not really careful, what we read into that is they went into a crowd and angrily yelled at them to stop sinning, to clean up their lives. Uh, when I was about 18 years old, I remember going on a trip, and, and I, was, I went to school at Texas A&M, and I was in the Corps of Cadets. We went to New Orleans to march in their parades. So I was not there to party. I was not there to be wild. But I remember as we were walking the streets, there was an evangelist with a big sign that said, repent. And he was holding up his sign, and he was just yelling, repent, repent, repent. And I stopped to listen to him, and eventually he said, repent, turn or burn. That was his message. And I thought, wow, man. He didn't even know who I was, but I I stopped for a minute and was trying to gather what he said. Repent, turn or burn. See, this message of repentance gets used so often as, man, your life is a mess. And if you want God to have anything to do with you, you better clean it up. When Jesus says this in, in Mark 1, repent and believe the gospel. And the word is literally change your mind and believe the gospel. I want you to think of the implications for that. That Jesus would show up and he's inviting people, not yelling at them. He's inviting inviting people. The time is fulfilled. In other words, all of history has been waiting on this. The kingdom of God is here. He's saying that the kingdom of God has now invaded earth again. That the person of Jesus, the, the son of God is here. And here's what I'm asking you to do. Change your mind. Change your mind. Did did you realize that the first step that God is calling you to take is to change your mind? It's not to stop sinning. If if you change your mind, you will stop sinning. But do you see that the first thing he asks you to do is to repent, which means I want you to change the way you're thinking. Change change the way you're thinking about what? I I want you to think differently about who God is. So, So why did Jesus come? Jesus came to show us what God is like, right? That Jesus came to show us that what kind of God God is, that he is just and merciful, that, that he is kind. And so he shows up and he says, I want you to change your mind. And the entire life and mission of Jesus is going to be, I want you to think differently about who God is. Because you've got some pictures in your mind about who God is. And you've got some thoughts in your mind about who God is that are not true. And so I want you to watch the way that I live my life. I want you to watch the way that Jesus speaks and acts and treats people. And I want you to begin to change your mind about who, who God is. And as you change your mind about who God is, you're going to begin to change your mind about who you are. As you change your mind about the kind of God that's in heaven, not an angry and tyrannical God trying to strike you down, but a God who is full of love and mercy. It says that his kindness leads us to repentance, right? He's kind, And because he's kind, he has approached us with kindness over and over again so that we can change our mind. And so he's saying, I want you to change your mind about who I am. And as you change your mind about who I am, you're going to begin to change your mind about who you are. You're, You're not the wretched, dirty sinner that everybody's convinced you you are. You are a sinner, but you've been offered to be washed by the blood of Jesus. Right. So that's the old you, not the new you. You've been offered to be washed by the blood of Jesus and to be called son or daughter and to not be ashamed to come into my presence and to be a vessel, a temple of the Holy Spirit of God. I want you to change your mind. See, I told you all this story a little bit two weeks ago, but the conversation that changed the course of my life happened about 12 years after I was baptized. I was baptized as a seven-year-old in a church much like this one, a Southern Baptist church in Pampa, Texas. Grew up knowing who Jesus was, knowing the story, feeling extremely confident that if I died, I was going to heaven. And I went to college, and and from about the age of uh, probably 13 until 20, I knew that I was a Christian, but I didn't know why I felt so empty. That's the only way I can explain it. I knew that I was a Christian. I knew that if I died, I was going to heaven, but I didn't know why my life felt so empty and what was missing. 
And I would lay in my bed at night and ask God over and over again, God, would you show me what's missing? Something's wrong. I know who Jesus is, and I know that you died for me, and I know that if I die, I'm going to go be with you. But, but something's missing. And one day, a random guy came and knocked on my door in my dorm, and he took me out to lunch. And we just began to talk, and he got to, began to know me, and we had lunch several times in a row. And he, he told me the third time we had lunch, he, he looked at me and said, Kyle, do you really believe that God loves you? And I said, yeah, I believe that. I've sung the song since I was seven years old. I, I know that Jesus loves us. And he looked back at me and said, Kyle, I don't think you really believe that. Because if you really believe that, everything in your life would look different. And I remember I was slightly offended that he said it to me. I was slightly offended that he was used by God to answer the prayer that I'd been praying for eight years of what's missing. And I went back to my dorm room, and I remember laying in my bed, and, and, and he told me, you need to start trying to, 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 to sort through Scripture and see, does God really feel that way about you? Does he, does he really love you that, that much? He doesn't just tolerate you. And he doesn't just, on your good days, think you're a pretty good guy. That the God of heaven actually loves you completely and fully, no less on your worst day than he does on your best day. Is there a God like that? And what began to happen over the course of three or four or five years, and I would say even 20 years later, this process of repentance that I needed to change my mind about who God was and about how he acted and felt towards me. And when that happened, I began to change my mind about who I was. I'm, I'm a son of God. I don't need to be ashamed. I don't need to hide from the things that I've done wrong. I can bring them fully to my Father and let the blood of Christ cover them and be a new person. Right? So, so there's a lot of you that, 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 that you're in this place. And I want to just say this, that, that repentance isn't a rebuke. Repentance is an invitation. God is not trying to rebuke you and say, change or else. He's not trying to, to, to guilt you and say, man, you better clean this area of your life up. The gospel is that God loves us on the front end, right? that he loves us first so that we can change, not that we change so that he can love us. Right? And so there's this repentance that needs to happen, that, that we change our minds. And then what I want you to see, this is how Christian life begins, and it's also the way that our Christian life should always be. Right? Repentance and belief, this is Christian life at its very most basic essentials. That for you to become a Christian means that you repent and believe the gospel. It's Jesus' message. For you to become a Christian means that you recognize, I have lived my life in rebellion against God, and I repent. I, I, I want to turn away from all that I've been doing and change my mind and say, you're a good God, and I want to follow you, and I want you to wash me clean. There, there's something really interesting in the scripture. There's places where the Bible uses the word sin as a singular, and there's places that the Bible uses the word sins plural. And the way that I try to describe this to people, when, when you first come to God and, and become a believer, you're not confessing your sins plural. You're confessing your sin singular. Right? Sin singular is an essence inside of me that produces sins plural outside of me. Does that make sense? So the good news for you, if you've ever been around Catholic churches or churches like that, they will tell you, confess your sins, plural. And I don't know about you, but that is exhausting, right? To try to take a mental inventory of everything I've always done wrong and then make sure I didn't miss any, it's, it's exhausting because I'm worse than I actually imagined, right? The deeper I go into it, the, the more I realize I, I don't know if I can ever get to the depth of that. God is telling you, I want you to repent and believe, confess your sin, singular, this essence of rebellion against God that you want to change your mind against. against. I want to change your mind and no longer live in rebellion to God. I want to submit to him and follow him. And what begins to happen is we repent and believe about our sin, that Jesus died once and for all and paid for it all, the sins that I committed yesterday and the sins that I commit today and tomorrow, that when Jesus yelled out, it is finished, that my sins were paid in full, that's what happens the moment I believe. Right? Repentance and belief brings me into new life with Christ. But, but here's what I want you to see. That process should never end. That process should never end. In fact, this is one of the best parts of being a Christian is that I get to ask God, would you please change my mind about everything? About everything. Would you please come into my life and come into my heart, take this heart of stone and make it a heart of flesh? I, I want to see everything the way you see everything. I want to see people the way you see people. I want to see money the way you see money. I want to invite you every moment of my life, would you come and change my mind? 
Do, do you see this isn't a rebuke, this is an invitation that the creator of all, the God who is good and kind and merciful, when he says repent and believe the gospel, the good news, he's saying, I want you to, to invite me to change your mind. So th- there's this tool that I want you to see. That there's a tool that we use a lot in our discipleship that we, we call the learning circle. And, and I actually referred to it two weeks ago when I started preaching. And I told you, I'm always going to ask two questions. Number one, what is God saying to me? And number two, what am I going to do about it? That is just taking repentance and belief and putting some questions to it. And so, so Gene, if you put the circle up there, th- this is a tool that I use over and over and over again in my life to stay in this posture of repentance and belief. And what I want you to see today is it relates to revivals in our city. Big things start small. And the small things that start is this process becoming the way you live your life. Not because you have to, but because God is inviting you to be something different and to be something better and to, to not try to earn his love, but just to walk in it. And, and so, so here's how this plays out. There's this, this top line that is just your life. And you can see that the X there says Kairos moments. The, the word Kairos is from the Mark 1, 14 and 15 passage. When Jesus says the time is fulfilled, the word he uses for time is kairos. And it's a Greek word that means a moment that changes everything. But there's this kairos moment in my life where I know that God is trying to speak into my life and show me something about life and about God or about myself that I've never seen before. But these kairos moments happen and then there's this circle that begins to play out. Half of it is repent. God, what are you saying to me right now? How are you ch- trying to change my mind? Maybe, maybe I've always thought that you're a mean and angry and distant God. And as I read your word and as I interact with you, maybe I'm starting to see that's not who you are. And then the second half of the circle is believe, right? Believe is an action word. Repent means my mind gets changed. The word faith or belief is a word that means I put that faith into action. And that I take steps towards him so that my life is, is different. Now, now here's the beautiful thing. Kairos moments are everywhere. I think a lot of us think that maybe God is only going to break through one or two times or three or four times. If you'll start listening and if you'll start paying attention, Kairos moments are everywhere. God is always trying to speak to you. God is always trying to show you new things about himself and yourself and the world. And as you begin to look for these moments where God is stepping in and just speaking into your life, these truths Life comes all together different. I'll share a story from my family because I think this kind of summarizes how it's played out in my family. There's this, this, this person that I want to be as a dad and as a husband. And so I try hard and then oftentimes I'm not what I wanted to be. And there was this moment probably 10 years ago that just, that just crushed me. My daughter at the time was about two years old and I had a long day at work and I got home and, and I, was, I had her in the bathtub and I was doing 15 other things at the same time. And I looked back and my daughter had a little bowl and she was just dumping water from the bathtub onto the ground. And I turned around and, and just in an instance, just yelled, no! Like any normal person would when your kid's pouring out water on the ground. But I looked at her eyes. I saw in her eyes fear and it just broke me. It just broke me. And so I sat there for a while and I was teared up during her bath. Like, man, that's not what I want my daughter to see. We finished the bath and and I got to this moment where I went back to my room and she was getting ready for bed. And there was this Kairos moment where I heard the voice of God who told me, Kyle, go sit down with your two-year-old and have a conversation. And then guess what I heard directly after the voice of God? These weren't literal voices, by the way. These are thoughts. But right after that thought, the thought came of, she's only two. She won't remember. Brush it under the rug and move on. See, every time God tries to speak into your life, there's a deceiver who who tries to take it and just twist it a little bit and give you a reason to not do what God told you to do. And so I remember wrestling with that, and I went back into my daughter's room. She was two years old, and I went down and sat beside her and just said, hey, Anna, I, I shouldn't have talked to you like that. I shouldn't have yelled at you like that. And she's two. She was already over it. She was like, it's okay, Daddy. No big deal. And I said, Anna, I'm so glad that Jesus came. I'm so glad that Jesus came. Do you know that Jesus came because your daddy failed and Jesus died for things like that? So would you forgive me? She said, sure. And we went on. Do you know how many times that conversation has played out in my house? 
with my kids, with my wife, with my parents, with my brothers. There's these Kairos moments where in your failure, God's asking you not to run away and hide it. He's asking you to run to him and own it and let the cross of Christ be what the cross of Christ is. And I say this sincerely. When my son and daughter were baptized in the last couple of years, I think the way that they learned the gospel most fully was by watching me fail. And that's humbling, but it's beautiful. Because I got to see the transition happen when my daughter failed. And she came to me as an eight or nine year old and had done something that she knew she shouldn't have done. And she confessed it to me. And all I said was, Anna, why did Jesus come? And she said, Jesus came to die for things like that and for people like me. See, I want you to know that you don't have to run and hide your failure. God uses failure and he actually prepares us to be the kind of people that he wants us to be through them. And it's through this process of repentance and belief, if we become really good at repenting, revival's gonna come. Revival's gonna come. What your families need to see is not a perfect parent. They need to see a repentant parent who believes in the cross of Jesus and believes in redemption. What your workplace needs to see is not a perfect employer or a perfect boss. We all know that we're not that. And we all know that the people around us aren't that. What they need to see is a humble person who's willing to confess and repent and believe the good news of Jesus, that he loves people like us and he saves people like us and he makes us different people. See, when repentance happens and we change our mind, renewal happens and we begin to change the environments around us. Our marriages and our families and our workplaces and our neighborhoods are different, not because we're so strong, right? They're different because in the midst of our weakness, we let Christ become strong. And we give people who are failures hope that in the midst of their failure, God can come alongside them as well. So repentance, the change of a mind, turns into renewal, the change of environment, and that turns into the change of a city and a state and a nation and a world. God takes these small things and he makes them big over time. So I wanna ask you to stand with me. I'm gonna just pray for us. And my prayer today is very simple. I think God wants to do some amazing things through us, but I think first he wants to work in us. It's always the case. And I think God wants to do some amazing things through you, in your family, in your workplace, in your neighborhood. He's positioned you to work through you. It's part of his desire. But before he works through you, he wants to do work in you. And so repentance today would become a joy for us. That this father who loves us, this father who knows us fully and doesn't run away from us, that he would begin to to, to speak into our lives these words that change us so that we can change the world around us. And so Father God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you don't shout at us in an angry voice to get our lives together. We thank you that you took on flesh and stayed silent on the cross while you were being nailed and and torn apart, that you stayed silent against your accusers so that you could forgive us and give us new life. God, we want to see big things happen in this city. We want to see big things happen in this church. We want to see big things happen in our families. We want to see revival. We want to see all that's broken in this world done away with and the kingdom of God reign on the earth. Father, would you give us patience? Would you give us diligence to let you do the small work of God in our hearts and in our minds and in our souls to change our minds over and over again? And as our minds are changed, as we see what kind of God you are and who we are in light of that, would you change the environments in this room But what would it be like if every person in this room was a different place, a different person in their families and in their workplaces? Father, would you take that? Would you take the people in this room and the renewal in this room, the change of the environment, families, workplaces? And Lord, let us see that you really are about changing this city, one person at a time, one home at a time, one workplace at a time. We love you, Father. We thank you so much that changing the world and renewing the world is your idea, not ours. We ask that you would do it and that you would let us be a part of that. But would you speak the words that what my brothers and sisters need to hear now? These places where you want to change their mind, would you speak 
Would you give them the strength to repent and believe the gospel and walk out of here a new person?